Well, with today being Palm Sunday, I thought I would preach a message that has nothing to do with it. (laughs) We're continuing on in our sermon series that we started last Sunday of the wrath of God and the will of man. It's based on Romans chapter 1, verses 18, through the end of that chapter, verse 32. Today, we pick up where we left off last week with verses 24 and 25. So if you have your Bible with you, we're looking at just two verses this morning. That does not mean the sermon's going to be shorter. Believe me, the food's still going to be there afterwards. Romans 1, 24 through 25, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And may the Lord bless us as we read his word together this morning. Well, there was a farm boy who accidentally overturned his wagon load full of corn on the road. The farmer who lived nearby came to investigate. Hey, Willis, he called out, forget your troubles for a spell and come on in and have dinner with us. Then I'll help you clean up the wagon. Well, that's mighty nice of you, Willis answered, but I don't think Pa would like that very much. Oh, come on, son, the farmer insisted. Well... All right, the boy finally agreed, but Pa's not going to like this. After a hearty dinner, Willis thanked his host. I feel a lot better now, but I just know Pa is going to be real upset. Don't be foolish, exclaimed the neighbor. By the way, where is your father? Under the wagon. I wanted to start off a very serious message with a little bit of humor because from here on out, it's going to get pretty heavy. If you think about it, there is a lot in life that requires us to have patience. Grocery lines, the dreaded customer service on the phone where you have to hear that jingle that plays as you wait and you wait and you wait and then you finally get somebody you can't understand. Waiting rooms at the doctor's office, just to name a few things. If you are under the age of 35, though, maybe you will never understand. So for anybody here or watching online who's under the age of 35, you will never understand how difficult it was for us to hear this. Does that bring back memories? And it would take forever, right? So we know that we can have our moments where our patience runs out or runs thin. But is there ever a time where God's patience with us or towards man, more in particular, runs out? Our text for today clearly answers that question with a yes. Contrary to popular belief, man is not inherently good. And to just clarify something here, as I talk through this message today and as we continue to go on through Romans in the weeks to come, when I use the word man or men, I'm not just talking about males. I'm talking about the human race apart from Christ. That's important to remember as I continue on in this. Men are wicked. They're evil. They are creatures that are filled with sinfulness and they're characterized as ungodly and unrighteous. You say, well, that's awful harsh to say, Pastor Tyler. But you know what? I'm not the one who said it. God did in his word. So because of this fact, 
we shouldn't be surprised when we see what we see taking place around us today. No matter how well a society begins, if a society is not having anything to do with the Lord, if a society is continually rejecting God, no matter how well a society begins, it will always descend to a place of immoral behavior and impending judgment of God in the way that it's presented to us here in Romans 1. Why? Why is that the case? Why does man inevitably sink to such a sad condition? The answer comes in what we're going to look at here a little closer. Because, and that answer is because God gives them up in their sinfulness or to their sinfulness. Now what does that mean? Why does God do such a thing? This and more is what we're going to look at as we dig into these two verses today. So before we do that, let's ask the Lord's blessing by going to him in prayer. Father, we come before you now. And Lord, I pray today, as this is going to be pretty heavy, I pray that we don't leave here feeling defeated or depressed, but that we have a fire underneath us to want to share the gospel to a world that is so desperately in need of you. We have opportunities that are given to us that you give to us continually. Lord, help us not to pass up on those opportunities to share Christ. Give us words, help us to trust you. And may you be glorified in our time together in your word now. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start off by looking at verse 24 again, something I entitled, The Essence of, Sinf of Man's Sinfulness. Look at verse 24 of our text. It says, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. You are going to see, as we continue on in this sermon series, that this is the first of the God giving man up that we're going to read. You will see a progression that is going to take place as man continues in their sinful state. So, the, the problem that sinful, lost man has is that not only are we depraved and sinful from birth, but the continuous rejection of God leads God to abandon man. That's the problem that rejecting man has. Even the religious among men, those individuals who, who claim to be following the ways of the Lord, but really are living in self-righteousness, even they cannot restrain evil and will inevitably do what is wrong. Why? Because religion cannot defeat or restrain evil. God only can. So when God gives someone up to the evil that they cannot restrain, what that really means is that God no longer restrains man and evil from embracing one another. Do you track with me so far? Because that is the story of the human race. And it really began way back in the Garden of Eden. The more that God lets go of the restraining influence of evil in the universe, the worse it gets for man. 2 Timothy 3.13 from the New American Standard Bible says this, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. As man compounds sin upon sin upon sin, it escalates to a point of, of where you end up with in the great tribulation period to come. It's a waxing worse until the end, that might be a phrase that you've heard before. 
in this great tribulation period that is to come according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the final restraints from God are going to be taken off and literally all hell is going to break loose on earth. Literally. Maybe you're asking yourself, as you look at Romans 1 here, how did this ever come to a point where God gave people up? Where he just turned them over to their sin and their evil desires. It goes back to what we look at last week in verse 18. If you look at verse 18, it says that God had revealed the truth to man and man suppressed it. Then in verse 19, it says that God made it plain to them through creation. Verse 20 says that th even though through that creation it's been seen, God's revelation, man rejected it and now is without excuse. No excuses to say, I didn't know there was a God over all creation. That's the story of man. The human race is not an ascent to God. It's not on an ascent to God. The human race is on a descent, racing on a descent from God. They're running as fast as they can. Away from his presence, away from his reality. And they're rejecting and denying the truth of the gospel message. That's what we're seeing in our country and in our world today. That's why verse 24 says what it says here. God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. When God gives man up, they sink into such depravity that it's almost beyond description. If you're listening, say amen. amen. Here's something to think about. We often think of the wrath of God and even though we think of the wrath of God and how Christ satisfied that wrath or what he did on the cross and rose from the dead, another part of that wrath of God that we think about is what I just mentioned a little bit earlier about the wrath to come, this great tribulation period, right? A lot of us think of either something that happened before with Christ or something that is to come. Rarely will we think about the wrath of God taking place right now. So the wrath of God is not something that is only the past or the future. The day of wrath is happening right now. You might say, well, how? How are we seeing God's wrath daily? According to what we're reading here, his wrath is be being revealed each and every day when he gives man up to their own sinfulness. That's the working out of his wrath today. He could restrain men, but he's so angry with the apostasy that he sees taking place that he lets them go. And the consequences of their own sin is the outworking of his wrath. I'll say that again. The consequences of man's sin is the outworking of God's wrath. C.S. Lewis, in his writing The Problem of Pain, says this. He says, The lost enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have demanded and are therefore self-enslaved. God gives the lost over to the consequence of their own sinfulness. Now maybe you've noticed this before. Or maybe not. But one of the problems in our society is that society is working super hard at trying to remove the consequences of sin. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Just think of all of the medicines that are out there to combat STDs. 
Granted, there may be individuals out there who seriously need this medicine in order to get better because they've learned their lesson and, and have repented and want to move on from the mistakes that they've made in the past. But the main push for this is not that. The main push is, hey, let's get this medicine, take away the consequences of what has taken place so that we can go out and have whoever, wherever, whenever we want. And we don't have to worry about this. God does not have to send fire from heaven to deal with sin. He's dealing with it right now. And allowing men's passions or the lusts that they have be the very instruments of his wrath. And so what we have is a world full of sexual offenders. What we have is a world full of people who live in moral permissiveness. A world of liars, a world of cheaters, thieves, gossipers, disobedient and loveless boasters because God has let them go. Maybe you've heard people say this before or maybe you've said this yourself at one point or another. If we continue on this path, God is going to judge America. Folks, God's judging America right now. One writer put it this way. Without God, there are no abiding truths. There are no lasting principles. There are no norms. And man is cast upon a sea of speculation and skepticism and attempted self-salvation. Is that not true? I believe what I'm going to say next is very important to hear. And we're going to look at this a little closer when we start in the series in James here in about a month. Even though sin is a result of God's wrath, God does not make men sin. You hear me when I say that? He just abandons them to their own perversity. This is why our society is the way that it is today. And maybe you look around and you say, what is going on? Why is this happening? Here it is. Romans 1 is what what it is. Maybe if you're old enough, you remember a time where it seemed like the restraints were still there. Maybe you think back to your childhood. Maybe you only have to think back 10, 20, 30 years. And it seemed like God was restraining people. But now it seems like more and more and more of those restraints are coming off. And why is that? Should it surprise us when God is being taken out of school? When God is it is being taken out of conversations. Monuments being taken down that have the Ten Commandments on it. People calling things good that have always been evil and then trying to push the agenda on us and saying, you need to accept this. This is the norm now. So far in this sermon, you might be like, boy, am I glad I came to church today. I feel depressed. If that's how you're feeling, or maybe you wouldn't admit it, I want to point out something. If you're still listening, say amen. When God abandons man to the point that we've been talking and reading about today, it's not necessarily to a point that is a forever act of damnation without any more recourse. 
God lets men go in the consequences of their sin, all the while continuing with this message of the gospel. Because if you think about it, the gospel of Jesus Christ begins with the fact that God let men go. So for you and I, this would apply. At one point, you were lost. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, at one point, you were lost. At one point, God opened your eyes to the truth of the gospel message. And you responded, and now you've gone from death to life. Second Peter, whoop. see what happens when you get all worked up. Second Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. If you were here when we went through First and Second Peter, you might look at that and you say, see, God wants to save everyone. But First and Second Peter was written to the church, to the elect. So when we look at this here, we see where it says, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to to come to repentance, those words any and all is an arrow that points back to the beginning of what Peter was saying and that any and that all is the elect. So what that's saying is that God is patient towards us because there's still individuals he wants to save. There are still people that he has predestined to come to know him. In other words, how would you like to be that last person that's going to come to faith in Christ before Jesus comes back? Whoo, right? <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 6, if we were to look at that, we're not going to look at that today. But if we were to look at 1 Corinthians 6, it's almost identical to what we see here in Romans 1, 18 through 32, in the sense where it lists off all of these uh, different types of sins, fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, etc., not being able to inherit the kingdom of God. But then Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and this is from the English Standard Version, and he says, and such were some of you. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It is those people who he's wanting to redeem. It is you and I who were once like them. So we look at someone and in our world today, who is so blatantly drenched in the sin that, they, that, that they're embracing in their life, and we may scoff at them, but were we not once one of them? Were we once not blind? But because of God's grace, now we see? In two weeks, I thought this message was tough. In two weeks, it gets tougher. People say, hey, just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. Let your heart lead you. If you hear advice like that, don't listen. That's horrible advice. Don't do that. Stop it. When hearts are deceived because they're depraved, they're unclean. Guess what's going to come out of that if you follow that kind of heart? More depravity, more uncleanliness. Proverbs 
4.23 says, Out of the heart springs the issues of life. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Not some. All. That's the word that is used. Here's what Jesus had to say about the heart in Mark, in Mark chapter 7, 21 through 23. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. And because of this, this depraved heart, that's why you see the results that you do in what we're reading here in Romans 1. God giving them over. That's how it goes in a society that has rejected God and where God has abandoned them to their rejection. They're left to their lustfulness, their wickedness, their uncleanliness. It's why we're hearing about things that forever have been considered as wrong, illegal, or detestable, namely pedophilia. Maps as they're called, or minor attracted persons. These are individuals who feel that they should have a right to love and be in a relationship with a minor. They're now trying to get support from the LGBTQ plus minus to the negative fourth power. I don't know, I've lost track of all of it. They're trying to get support from that community saying, hey, your motto is love is love. So let us be a part of it. So far, they have not allowed them to be a part of this. But, as we're seeing here, more and more of the depravity will eventually come to a place where they will accept this. It will be acceptable. Laws will be changed. Why? Because this is the pattern in a society where God has let individuals go. It's the very thing that verse 25 says as we come to the end of our message today. Believing this lie. Look at verse 25. Because, so we just read, therefore God gave them up the lust of the heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among men, or among, among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. They had the truth of God written in their hearts, visible all around them, and they didn't want it. So they rejected it and exchanged that truth for a lie. This means that they exchanged the truth of God for false gods. And the lie is that God is not God. That he either doesn't exist, doesn't have to be obeyed, honored, or glorified. That we're our own gods. That we're in charge. And this is not a new lie, is it? It's the lie that Satan whispered to Adam and Eve in the garden. We may look at verse 25 and say, well, I'm not seeing people worshiping statues or crafting golden calves and bowing down to them, but if you remember from sermons past, idols don't necessarily have to be physical things, do they? They certainly can, but they don't have to be in the form of golden calves. They can be cars, they can be houses, they can be clothes, they can be money, they can be our bodies, they can be someone else's body. It can be success, it can be power, it can be a plethora of other things. They worship anything or anyone but God. And that's why God gave them 
He gave them up to what they want. And as we saw last week, in our depraved, dead state, what you and I want prior to coming to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what we want is evil. What we want is anything that doesn't have to do with the whole counsel of God. We may take snippets. We may take a little bit of love. We may take a whole lot of blessings. We're all right with that. But denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following him, him being the only way to salvation, hmm. So we might come to this point here in our text and, and we might say, boy, this sounds like a very hopeful or hopeless state that we're in. When I leave here today, I just throw up my hands and say, well, well, nothing I can do about it. If that's the way you feel when you leave here today, you miss the point entirely. Why is Paul writing what he's writing here? Why am I preaching what I'm preaching here? It's not just to give facts. Is it not to motivate? Is it not for us to open our eyes and examine our own hearts before we start looking at other people? Taking the log out of our own eyes before we notice the speck in our brother's or, or someone else's eye? This is the motivation. We're called not to just sit on our keisters and do nothing. Say, well, God's going to be God. He's going to do what he's going to do. I'll just sit back and I'll just watch it all happen. Did Jesus not say and give us a great commission to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And after looking at a something like this and, and, and hearing a message like this, should that not be even more motivation? Well, what if they reject me? Did they not reject him? Well, what if they say mean things about me? Suck it up! We're a bunch of wimps! It, it, there's places in other parts of this world, and I speak for myself too, there's, there's other places in other parts of this world where people are being beheaded for their faith. And I don't want someone to say something mean about me. We're a bunch of wimps. What's going to happen if this pattern continues in our country today to the point that we're already seeing take place as you saw in the news? Someone going into a Christian school and shooting it up. This is a warning. This is a warning to us, church, this is just a taste of what is to come. We know that the world is waxing worse, but we know that Jesus is returning. We know there's going to come a time when people will not have a second chance. So what are we doing about it now as the church? Are we ready? Are we ready to face what many parts of this world are already facing. Christians in other parts of this world. Are we ready? Are we actively sharing the gospel message without thinking, oh no, what are they going to think about me? Oh no, what if this causes a rift between us? Is not the soul of that person more important than running the risk of, is this going to cause a rift? If you and I could somehow be given the ability to, to see the future of someone who has rejected Jesus Christ to the point that when their life here on earth is done, and we could somehow see the agony and the pain like it is described in what I preached yesterday from Luke chapter 16 about the rich man and Lazarus 
in agony in Hades. Just wishing for someone to dip the tip of their finger in cool water to, 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 to bring them relief from the agony that they were in. If we were able to be able to visually see that from something that God would give us, would it motivate us? The end of that, if you're familiar with that parable of Lazarus and the rich man, the end of that, after the plea of, hey, send, send, this, send someone from the dead, The end of that says, even if someone rises from the dead, they would not be convinced. Did not Jesus rise from the dead? Are we not going to be celebrating that next Sunday? And yet, people don't believe. Folks, even though we see what we see taking place in our country today, don't stop preaching the gospel. I say that for myself too. I miss, I, I pass up on so many opportunities. Whether it be fear, whether it be just to want to bother someone, whether it be uh, whatever. Let's not miss those opportunities any longer. Let's actually pray that God would give us opportunities. <gasps> I don't want to pray that. That's going to be uncomfortable for me. Good, let's get uncomfortable. In a couple weeks, we're going to get back into our text here and see what it means as God continually gives man up in the expressions of their evil hearts. Let's pray. Father, may we be, leave here today not feeling depressed. May we not leave here today feeling hopeless. May we not leave here today feeling like we were just beat up. May we leave here today encouraged and motivated and passionate more than ever before about the gospel. Help us to not look at others who don't know you in a sense where we only wish evil upon them. And I know that's hard. But Lord, help us to remember that they need the same grace that we were saved by. Help us, Lord, to have tender hearts. Help us, Lord, to take the risk of being rejected, all with the motivation of not wanting to see someone go to hell. May you be glorified in our life and, and help us to just have the right words. Help us to trust you. Help us to not... Be content with sitting on the sidelines. For time is short. And we don't know if we have tomorrow. And we don't know when it is that you are going to send Christ back. But until then, help us to be about your business. And so I pray this now in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.